Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mut Genç. I'm the CEO of eTron Technologies. So for those of you who doesn't know eTron, we are a software startup based in Warwick, and we develop automotive software for battery management systems, advanced driver assistance systems, level two and uh, above, and as well as uh, adaptive damping systems, so semi-active suspension software. So we are pure software play, and we license and sell our software to OEMs and tier ones. And I'll tell you, actually, we are already delivering some software for production. So it's not just an idea, it's happening, especially in Asia. And I personally, I'm not a software expert, but I'm a controls expert, or used to be. So I have a PhD in controls. So I used to do algorithm development and then rapid prototyping and all that. But some of the latest software topics, I will also share with you my experience, what I see from the, from the team. And my talk has two parts. In the beginning, I'm going to kind of tell you what's happening in autonomous driving in the industry, especially I'm going to talk about the level four hype. I think we all know, uh, we all know about it now. And then I will then in the second half, we'll uh, kind of bring it together with the challenges of software development, especially for production use, not just the demo vehicles. Oops, wrong way. Right? Yeah, so that's the title, Challenges of Developing ADA Software for Serious Production or Serial Production. So you all know the levels. I'm not going to spend time here. So we got different levels of ADAS, but really it gets tricky when you go beyond level two. And I have to tell you that uh, level five, I don't like personally, because level five means autonomy everywhere, you know, under every condition, anytime. And that's not a good uh, engineering definition, right? There is no such perfect system. So my focus is level four, and I'm going to tell you why it is so difficult to achieve level four in mass production and why there is the hype. And of course, ADAS has been with us for a long time, since 60s, started with cruise control, then the, the, the ABS traction. And actually, if you had buy a premium car, late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of the ADAS features, level one, already was implemented in those premium vehicles. So it's, it's nothing new. And now I'm going to kind of touch upon this big, big hype, right? And uh, I think most of you are aware of it. If you go back five, six, seven years, there was a lot of big promises in the industry. And I'm going to share some headlines. Like Elon Musk, I think we all know him, we love him. And he claimed that, you know, this uh, Teslas will be fully autonomous in 2017. And then, of course, uh, our good old friends Ford, they were more cautious. They promised 2021, right? We will have all this mass-produced autonomous cars. We know it didn't happen. Then Mercedes, that, uh, that title was from 2017, so that was 2020. To my surprise, I mean, Japanese OEMs, right? they, they, they made big promises, and GM. But the names are not important. So all the OEMs, if you go back five, six years, you know, they were making big promises about level four autonomy. And I thought about it, why it didn't work out. I think if they had asked us at the time, we would tell them as you know, automotive software people, but nobody asked us, right? They were just making this big hype. And to explain this, and maybe some of you know this model, I looked into this Gartner hype cycle. That's a model used by this consultancy for emerging technologies. And basically what you got on the vertical axis, you have expectations, this is like emotions. And at the horizontal axis, you've got different stages of an emerging technology. So you've got innovation triggers, of course, you have to all these enablers. And then this is the tricky part, right? You have the peak of emotions, the hype. You know, everyone gets excited, and this could be anything. Quantum computing, this could be fuel cells, I think we're all talking about it, maybe. And then usually what happens, then you have a, a kind of, you know, a big cliff. Because all that promises, most of the time, right, don't materialize. And then in this model, it's called this kind of a dead valley. And then if you are lucky, 10% of emerging technologies can go back to the next level, and then it becomes a mature technology. So not every technology will go through all the stage, right? A lot of them get stuck here. And basically, that's also what happened with uh, level four autonomous driving in the last 10 years. But I want to just uh, very quickly touch upon the, the innovation triggers for level four autonomy, why the whole society industry got excited. 
and this would refresh your, uh, I think, your mind. But I think one, so there were like four, and this is my personal view, I think four drivers for these innovation triggers. One was DARPA challenges, oops, sorry. DARPA challenges happened in the US, and this was between 2004 and 2007, and these were, these were all uh, organized by the Department of Defense, a lot of universities, like you know, the Stanford, they joined this, and the first time that, that, that happened in 2004, there was no winners, right? This was taking an autonomous car through the desert, more than 200 kilometers. So the first race, no winners. 2005, there were several winners. And then in 2007, they had the urban challenge, right? Again, there were winners. The, re the reward was like $2 million, a lot of money. But the significance is, if you look at all the founders, the CEO, the senior leadership of all these well-known autonomous driving startups in the US, they all took part in this DARPA challenge. So the DARPA challenge enabled the human pool for the upcoming, you know, this hype. Then you, you have the neural networks, convolutional neural networks, this image net challenge. Basically, suddenly we found out this new network structure, which was really good for object detection. It started in 2012, and by 2015, these neural networks were performing better than humans detecting, detecting objects. Then, of course, you got a lot of money from VCs, and then the last one, I think a lot of you are interested also, the good old Moore's Law, right? When I was doing my PhD early 2000s, there were a lot of articles. Will that continue? Can we really, you know, increase the number of chips or the computation power, you know, continuously? But actually it happened. Today, if you buy a cutting edge uh, a chip, I think there are like 50 billion transistors on it. 50 billion, not million, this is unbelievable. So all these triggers enabled this hype. But then what happened? Yeah, 10 years move forward and billions of dollars. Basically, I think we solved, as the engineers, maybe 90, 95% of the problems. But some of the very critical areas, right, state, because it's a very complex problem. One was around safety, and I think uh, more presenters will talk about it later on. And then, of course, the complexity for level four, system complexity as well as the software complexity and legislation. Now, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about software, right? What it means, you know, this, this software complexity, especially if you want to take this software stack to production in automotive. Not having, you know, 10, 20 demo cars running around. I think this can be done. Even you can have hundreds of cars, you know, uh, running around in certain areas. But if you really want to get this automotive software stack for serial production, it gets very challenging. And this is also from our personal experience. So as e-tron, actually, we are delivering some level 2 and level 2 plus ADA software stack to serial production in Asia. And this is real experience of the team in the last one year. And the high-level overview is this, the ADA software for level two plus and beyond is not just software, right? So there's a lot of systems engineering involved in it, so you need to have a strong systems engineering team. There are a lot of software development processes you have to execute, right? Not just to be cycle, but there's this A spice. And then functional safety, and again, there are different uh, versions of it and different, you know, uh, connected ones, the FUSA, SOTEF, and there are new ones are coming. But still, you have to be fast and agile, right? Because still, the customers want everything done in two years, and you know, so everything gets very complex. But there is not enough budget, time, and resource. And the last part, again, very well known, is how do we very verify and validate all these complex ADAS functions? So this is the good old V-cycle. That's what we used to do 20 years ago, yeah? Using MATLAB simulating, rapid prototyping, go to hill, go to the test bed, go to the vehicle, and this was working. But if you want to do, yeah, ADA software development for SOP now, first of all, you have to deal with all these different processes, as I mentioned. So you have all these uh, different safety requirements and the processes, which is very complex, right? because you have to start with the system level, technical safety concept. Then you have hardware and software, yeah, uh, uh, kind of uh, division, and they all interact with each other. So 
even though you are only developing software, you have to have some experts who understand, you know, how to get the system level functional safety right so that you get the right requirements for your software functions. Then we got automotive supplies. In itself, I think, makes everything very time consuming. Right? So if you want to write some requirements, you have to follow certain rules. If you want to release a software, again, you have to go through a, a fixed process. You can't just make a release if you make a change. So in the old days, what we used to do in half a day now takes, I don't know, one week, two weeks. And then there are also new standards coming, like this. Uh, I think this is driven by Intel and Mobileye. Again, this is just upcoming, but this is a bit like rule-based safety definition. There are certain rules you have to do or don't do, right? So if there's a traffic light, you have to go slow. I mean, one of the rules is, yeah, don't hit the car ahead of you. OK, let's see what happens. But this is very, very complex, considering that we have limited time to go to production. And then systems engineering. For an ADA system, this gets, again, extremely complex because you have all the sensors, right? The radars, the lidars, the cameras. You have the compute unit. You have the EE architecture. And then you have to make sure that the systems engineering teams and the software teams and the control teams, they can communicate together. And usually these domains, right, they don't use the same language. And then you have to define all the use cases. You have to define all the different ODDs, yeah, operating design domains. You need to have traceability. And then at the end, you need to also kind of have good user experience. And the user here is the driver. So bring it, all that together. And we do then, then you have to do verification and validation. And that's another challenge because for other kind of powertrain systems, we usually used to define, OK, we need to drive 1 million miles with 100 you know, test vehicles. And that will give you, I don't know, 99% confidence so that I can do my production sign off. But with an ADA system, the mileage doesn't make sense because it's all about you know, how many times a certain feature being activated. You can do 100,000 miles, and maybe you get two emergency braking events. So what is your confidence? Right? You don't. And then all these machine learning algorithms that you use in your perception and decision making is based on data. So you need to collect a lot of data. You need to have the right IT infrastructure to deal with all this data you know, from, the, from the fleet. And, and on top of it, you need advanced simulation capabilities. So really, our experience is, as a software company, we get into this, you know, the ADAS SOP delivery business, but suddenly you need systems engineering expertise within the team, you need the, the, the functional safety people, and you need the quality people, the ASPICE people, so it gets extremely complex. And to me, that also explains why all those big promises, right, by big companies saying that, oh, okay, in two years we will be in mass production, going from a, a, a kind of a minimum demo version of the software to a mass production version is extremely complex because you have to tick all of those boxes. Even if you have unlimited budget, this makes it very, very tricky. And the last three slides. So some of the learnings I want to share, right? First of all, you need to mix the automotive processes with agile methods to catch up the timeline. And the other one is the continuous improvement you have to do on the software development. And this is what we used here. And uh, for those of you coming from automotive, at the top, we have more traditional software development, right? A, B, C, D samples, the launch, the job form plus one. And then you have the yeah, usual, the, the, the concept, development, and all that. And at the, the bottom part, the second half, you got the more agile one. So basically, you define different epics right, for each software release. And then within the epics, you do sprints. And then you can really bring together the controls people together with the software people and still keep some agile and fast development that is needed to actually, again, tackle this complex software development. Virtual testing is very critical. And here, what basically we are doing is 
the initial virtual simulation we do in a, in a, in a desktop PC, but then you upload all these simulations to cloud and you run, I don't know, thousands of them in parallel to make sure that you can simulate all different use cases and scenarios. And you have to do that in an automated way. And the last one is, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the SOP software development for ADAS is a continuous process. So you can't just you know, develop a software piece and you say that, okay, I'm, I'm gonna update that once a year. So you need to have a, have a, a, like a continuous uh, process where you basically continuously put some updates on the feature, initially in the GOS mode, right? And then you collect data. Of course, this is event-based. And all the interesting edge cases, you know, all the interesting scenarios, you take it back to cloud, you go through your development process, and if everything works, then you, you make your small update again. And, but you have to go through that through the lifetime of your ADA software stack. So it's an extremely complex piece. And basically, in my personal opinion, it will still take at least five to 10 years to see anything beyond level three in mass production in ADA software. Do we have any time for questions, Rob, or is it? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.